Here's the truth Pepsi don't want you to know. Pepsi started off as a ripoff of Coca-Cola, and they even tried to sell their company to Coca-Cola on three separate occasions. But Coke kept turning them down. As a result, Pepsi struggled and literally went bankrupt on two separate occasions. And yet, fast forward to present day, and PepsiCo makes around $80 billion of revenue a year, more than double the Coca-Cola company. You see, Pepsi is no longer just a drinks business. They are a gigantic empire that owns more food and beverage products than you can even imagine. Lay's, Gatorade, Cheetos, Aquafina, Tropicana, Quaker Oats, Mountain Dew, Doritos. The brands PepsiCo owns are endless. In fact, at one point, Pepsi even started buying giant fast food chains like KFC and Pizza Hut. They were even negotiating a deal to buy a huge fleet of Navy warships. So how did all of this happen? How did Pepsi go from bankruptcy to global domination? From humble beginnings to controversial conglomerate with blood on its hands? Welcome to the insane history of Pepsi. The story of Pepsi begins with a man named Caleb D. Bradham, who was born in 1867. Caleb grew up in a very small farming town in North Carolina. His father worked as a local merchant, but his family was very wealthy. And because of this, Caleb was able to receive the best education and went off to become a doctor at the University of North Carolina. However, his father suddenly ran into financial trouble and could no longer afford to make the tuition payments. So Caleb was forced to drop out of school. Despite this, when he returned to his small town, the local treated him as if he actually was a qualified doctor, because there was no other doctor available for miles around. So Caleb gave out medical advice, whilst also working as a local teacher so he could save up money. Within two years, he'd earned enough money to go back to college. But this time, he decided he didn't actually want to be a doctor anymore. Maybe it was because of years of helping the local residents with their medical problems, but Caleb had decided he now wanted to become a pharmacist instead. So after graduating in 1892, at age 25, Caleb Bradham purchased a building in New Bern, North Carolina to open the Bradham Pharmacy. At the time, drugstores like this were incredibly popular and were a place where locals would actually hang out and socialize. It was common to have a counter for people to sit and chat whilst having some snacks and a cold drink. That's because most of the pharmacies had a soda fountain, where soda was made by mixing carbonated water with whatever flavor the customers chose. And there were hundreds of flavor syrups to choose from, like orange, grape, rose, and countless more. Caleb was a very social person, so by running a pharmacy of his own, he quickly made friends with nearly everyone in the town. Now, that exact same year Caleb started his pharmacy business, 1892, the Coca-Cola company was founded in Atlanta, Georgia. They had developed a cola syrup recipe that was sold at pharmacy soda counters. And so it wasn't long before Caleb Bradham had been introduced to Coca-Cola's drink. Caleb very quickly saw the huge potential of it. It was immediately a popular choice amongst customers when deciding what to order from the soda fountain. But Caleb thought the only problem was that the original founder of Coca-Cola had mixed addictive chemicals into the recipe. So Caleb had the idea to make his own very similar version of cola syrup, but leave out the ingredients he considered harmful. Because Caleb wanted to make a true health drink that relieves indigestion, but had the same cola flavor that everyone seemed to love. And thus, Caleb's cola syrup was a mix of natural flavors like caramel, rare oils, and fruit juice extract. Once Caleb settled on the formula, he started to offer it as a new flavor at the soda counter in his pharmacy and encouraged his friends to try it. The locals nicknamed his cola beverage Brad's Drink, in reference to the surname of its creator, Caleb Bradham. And for the next five years, the locals would regularly request Brad's Drink at the pharmacy's soda fountain simply because they liked the taste. After years of hearing the locals tell him how good it was, Caleb finally built up the confidence to try sell his product elsewhere. By this time, Coca-Cola was growing massively successful, and Caleb knew that there was a demand for more cola drinks on the market. So in 1898, he officially changed the name of his product to Pepsi Cola. The word Pepsi comes from the Greek word pepsis, which means digestion. Because at this point, Caleb still believed focusing on the health aspect was gonna be key. However, what actually was most popular was the taste. And before long, he was selling large kegs of Pepsi Pepsi syrup to supply other soda fountains across the country. For years, Caleb was creating Pepsi Cola in the back room of his pharmacy, and in 1903, Caleb officially established the Pepsi Cola company. He closed down his pharmacy so he could fully focus on Pepsi. In the first year as an actual registered company, they sold over 8,000 gallons of syrup, and Caleb reinvested his earnings into advertising in local newspapers, which helped the brand grow even more. Sales more than doubled to 20,000 gallons of syrup in 1904, and Pepsi was now far too big of 
of an operation to run out of the pharmacy. So Caleb bought a bigger building to use as a factory to produce Pepsi in larger quantities. He also partnered with bottling companies who wanted to be part of the Pepsi franchise, thus allowing Pepsi to be sold by the bottle instead of just as a syrup sold to soda fountains. By 1910, Pepsi Cola was working with 250 bottling companies across 24 states. And by 1915, Pepsi Cola's assets were worth more than $1 million. Caleb Braddon bought a big house for his wife and children to live in, and he was so popular in the local area, people were encouraging him to run as the governor of North Carolina. By all accounts, Caleb had made it. But that all changed after the start of World War I. During the war, the price of sugar skyrocketed due to strict rations. Before the war, a pound of sugar cost just five cents, but during the ration, it jumped to 22 cents per pound and the price seemed to be increasing every month. So Caleb assumed that the price would continue to rise, and he decided to pour huge amounts of money into stockpiling more sugar. If his theory was right that the price of sugar would keep increasing like this, all the sugar he'd bought would soon be extremely valuable. He'd also be able to produce his drink much cheaper than any competitors who would be paying way higher prices for their sugar. However, Caleb's theory was completely wrong. Just six months later, the sugar price crashed down to three cents per pound, making it even cheaper than before the war started. To make matters worse, most factories in America had to prioritize making products for the war effort. So Pepsi went from having 250 bottling factories to just two. So the amount of product they could sell was drastically cut down. Basically, Caleb had spent more on sugar than what the company was able to earn. They couldn't use it all, and the current market price for that sugar was way below what he'd paid for it. Things spiralled out of control, and in 1920, Pepsi Cola filed for bankruptcy. Caleb was 53 at this point, and he had to sell off all the remaining company assets like the Pepsi trademark and drink formula, and thus Caleb returned to his old career as a pharmacist. By 1934, Caleb was dead. And so the original creator of Pepsi never got to see the insane success his company would soon go on to have. After acquiring what was left of the Pepsi company, for eight straight years, the new owners desperately tried to increase the value of the business. But then the stock market crashed in 1929, and suddenly the economic situation was looking very bleak. At this point, Pepsi had just one bottling plant in Richmond, Virginia, and they were failing to make a profit. So Pepsi declared bankruptcy a second time, and they were forced to sell Pepsi to the Loft Candy Company in 1931. So Pepsi had now gone bankrupt twice with two different owners, and had now been passed on to a third different owner. However, for Pepsi's biggest competitor Coca-Cola, things were looking much brighter. Whilst Pepsi had been struggling so much through World War I and the Great Depression, Coke had managed to secure a wartime contract with the United States government to sell Coke overseas. And so they'd been expanding all over the world. Of course, the new owners of Pepsi were desperate to make money back on their investment, and after seeing Coke's success, they thought they'd come up with the perfect solution. Sell Pepsi to Coca-Cola. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, there were three separate attempts to sell Pepsi to Coca-Cola but they refused every time. In retrospect, imagine how much money Coke could have saved themselves if they'd bought out their future biggest rivals when they had the chance. But at the time, understandably, no one believed that Pepsi could turn their luck around. So when Coke rejected the chance to buy Pepsi three separate times, eventually the Pepsi owners, the Loft Candy Company, realized they needed to try and find another way to save the business. One of the first great decisions they made was when Pepsi began using recycled beer bottles to save money on production costs. This meant they were able to charge just five five cents for a 12 ounce bottle of Pepsi. That was twice the amount of soda that was offered in a Coca-Cola bottle for the same price. Remember, the Great Depression was still going on at the time, so people were looking to save money any way they could. So buying Pepsi instead of Coke was an obvious choice for a lot of people, given they were getting double the amount. The next important decision by Pepsi was their heavy investment in advertising campaigns, as this really helped the company take off. There were billboards, skywriting, a comic strip, and even a popular new jingle that played over the radio. This Pepsi Cola radio jingle was just 15 seconds long in total, so it was cheaper to buy than the typical 60 second advertisement. This way, Pepsi were able to pay more radio stations across America to run these ads over and over again until people had the jingle stuck in their heads. 
However, now that the Pepsi company was growing in popularity, Coca-Cola obviously wasn't happy about losing business to Pepsi. So in 1938, Coca-Cola took Pepsi Cola to court for trademark infringement over their use of the word cola. Obviously, Coke had known about Pepsi Cola's name for years, but they hadn't bothered to sue them until now, because until now, they didn't think Pepsi was any sort of threat. But it was quickly becoming clear Pepsi was cutting into Coke sales. So in court, Coca-Cola argued that Pepsi was infringing on their copyright, while Pepsi countered that Coke was trying to form an illegal monopoly over the entire cola industry. In the end, Pepsi Cola got to keep its name, although they eventually shortened the name to just Pepsi. But there was trouble on the horizon for Pepsi. In 1939, World War II began. And after what happened with the sugar rationing in World War I, you might think that another war would spell another disaster for Pepsi. But this time around, they came up with a clever plan to stay in business. Pepsi decided to change the colors of their brand to red, white, and blue to show their patriotism. They also set up a campaign called Your Man in Service, where Pepsi installed recording booths all around the United States so that soldiers could record a message to their family for free. This obviously generated a lot of goodwill and patriotism towards Pepsi. Then, during the 19th 1940s, Pepsi also made the very successful decision to market their drink to the African American community, and hired an all black sales and marketing team to create the ads. This was huge, because most of Pepsi's competitors only featured black people in the form of stereotypes. So the African American community was a huge untapped market that most other brands were ignoring. With all of these successful advertising campaigns, Pepsi was able to make it through World War II stronger than ever. They were just getting started. In 1950, Pepsi hired a man named Alfred Steele as the new CEO. This was slightly controversial, as he was the former vice president of Coca-Cola. And thus, Alfred was an expert on what it took to make a cola company successful, and he quickly made several changes to the Pepsi brand. In particular, he liked to focus on giant advertising campaigns and big sales promotions. He started introducing beautiful and glamorous women to Pepsi advertisements, and Alfred Steele also just so happened to be married to the famous actress Joan Crawford, so he brought her on as a model for Pepsi too. Since since she was one of the biggest names in Hollywood, her celebrity endorsement of the product massively boosted sales. Alfred also pushed for a brand new logo and slogan. They completely redesigned a swirl bottle, which made the drink look more stylish. Alfred's extensive ad campaigns and branding changes helped Pepsi grow out of its poor man's cola image that some people associated with Pepsi. He also made changes behind the scenes, like giving teams within Pepsi's company more autonomy, thus empowering them to bring new ideas forward. All of these changes helped increase Pepsi's sales from $1.6 million in 19 to $11.5 million in 1958. Alfred Steele is remembered for being one of the most successful CEOs in all of Pepsi history. Without him, the brand might not be what it is today, but sadly, his career was short-lived because he died of a heart attack in 1959. So it was time for Pepsi to find new leadership, and the job soon fell to a man named Don Kendall, who'd been with Pepsi for his entire career. He'd worked his way up the corporate ladder from a syrup salesman all the way to Pepsi president and then CEO. And one of his first decisions was quite surprising. Don decided to bring Pepsi to the Soviet Union. It was, of course, a massive market, and importantly, a market Coca-Cola had not entered. Now, that was largely because this was during the Cold War, and so there was actually an organization called the House Un-American Activities Committee, which would make sure that US businesses had nothing to do with the Soviet Union. However, that changed in 1959, when US President Dwight Eisenhower wanted to bring American culture to the Soviet Union and show them the benefits of capitalism, and thus they hosted the 1959 American National exhibition in Moscow. Pepsi's new leader Don Kendall saw this exhibition as a big opportunity to introduce Pepsi to the Soviet Union. And he was right. There's even a photo of the former Soviet leader sampling Pepsi for the first time during this exhibition. And after this successful introduction at the exhibition, Pepsi managed to agree a deal with the USSR where Pepsi would become the very first American brand to be sold in the Soviet Union. However, there was one big problem. Because of controls the Kremlin put on their currency at the time, the Soviet ruble, it was actually illegal to trade their currency globally, meaning there was literally no international currency exchange market for the ruble, and thus it was essentially worthless outside the USSR. And Pepsi certainly didn't want to be stuck with profits that they couldn't take out of the Soviet Union. So, instead of selling Pepsi to the Soviet Union for cash, they agreed to use a barter system. For years, Pepsi accepted Stolichnaya Vodka as payments. 
And Pepsi also received exclusive rights to distribute this vodka in the United States. So basically, the Soviet Union got Pepsi concentrates, and in return, Pepsi got Russian vodka, which they could sell in the US and therefore make US dollars from it. And so this workaround seemed win-win, as Pepsi could sell their product in the Soviet Union whilst bypassing the currency issue. And for a while, this was all well and good, until 1979, where Pepsi became unable to sell enough of the vodka for this deal to make financial sense anymore. So they needed to figure out something else they could receive from the USSR instead. Ideally something more valuable, so Pepsi could very quickly sell it for dollars. Now, there is a long-standing story that in 1989, the Soviet government paid Pepsi by giving them a fleet of decommissioned warships. The idea was, Pepsi would be able to make money from selling the ships for scrap metal. And this was reported in the New York Times, saying, PepsiCo recently bought from the Soviets 17 submarines, cruiser, a frigate, and a destroyer. They are being resold for scrap. The head of Pepsi then joked to George Bush's national security advisor, we're disarming the Soviet Union faster than you are. And so, because of this warship deal worth hundreds of millions of dollars, articles have popped up saying that technically, Pepsi briefly became the sixth largest military in the world before they sold the ships for scrap metal. However, this isn't actually the case. Although Pepsi having its own navy fleet would take the meaning of Cola Wars to a whole new level, the actual truth seems to be that even though Pepsi considered this warship deal, they didn't go through with that. Instead, they drew up a new agreement for the Soviet Union to build Pepsi commercial freight ships instead, which they could sell all these out. And ironically, all of this was completely irrelevant anyway, as the plan fell through when a few months later the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Pepsi did remain a huge presence in Eastern Europe still though, and in fact Russia was one of the handful of countries where Pepsi outsold Coca-Cola. And over the years, Pepsi expanded its presence in Russia. Like in 2008, PepsiCo bought the majority of shares in Russia's largest juice manufacturer, and then acquired another huge Russian brand, Wimbledon Foods, which made PepsiCo the largest food and beverage manufacturer in Russia. However, in 2022, that all changed after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and so Pepsi stopped manufacturing in Russia. And thus, Pepsi's unusual decades-long relationship with Russia was finally over. Before we get to the next chapter of the story, let's quickly talk about what's going on in present day. Right now, it seems like artificial intelligence is at the top of the discussion for many businesses all over the world. Even Pepsi is using AI to create products consumers don't know they want yet. But with all of these exciting AI developments going on, how can you yourself be a part of this AI revolution? Well, that's where today's video sponsor comes in, the investment platform Moomoo. If you go to Moomoo and type ChatGPT in the search box, you can see the performance of AI stocks related to ChatGPT, and check out their analyst ratings to get assessments on whether you may want to buy, hold, or sell any of these AI stocks yourself. And it gets even better. When you open a free account, you get one free stock just for registering. Then you get four more stocks if you deposit $100, and 10 more free stocks if you deposit $1,000. So that's up to 15 free stocks. This is a limited deal though, so click the link below now to get your free stocks, and then you can also begin using Moomoo's AI stock feature. Once you've done that, let's get back to the story. Over the years, Pepsi became dissatisfied with simply selling beverages. They wanted to expand into snack foods, because they knew that their target customer was buying both soda and snacks at the grocery store at the same time. They were complementary products. So what if Pepsi sold both? But rather than starting from scratch in a new market, in 1965, Pepsi merged with the snack company Frito-Lay, and together they became a new corporation called PepsiCo. Between them, the brands had combined sales of over $500 million already, and within five years of forming PepsiCo together, they reached $1 billion in sales. This merger between Pepsi and Frito-Lay was a move that worked very well for both of them, as they knew teaming up to become one giant corporation would be the fastest way to expand into new markets and pool their resources to help grow across the world. What's interesting is that just a few years earlier in 1961, the Frito Company and the H.W. Leyen Company had been two separate businesses that merged together to form the Frito-Lay Company. And yet, just four years after that, they were merging with Pepsi to create PepsiCo. And so all of this really just illustrates how business actually works. Two successful companies merge together to form one even more powerful company that can then crush or acquire smaller competition. And this is basically how conglomerates get formed, which is why nowadays, 
you may be shocked to know just how many brands are owned by PepsiCo. Lay's, Gatorade, Cheetos, Aquafina, Tropicana, Quaker Oats, Mountain Dew, Doritos, Cap'n Crunch, Rockstar, and so many more. It'd be hard to go shopping and not buy something owned by PepsiCo. But as if dominating in food and beverages wasn't enough, PepsiCo even acquired three of the top 10 restaurant chains in the United States. Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and KFC. Goes without saying that as soon as they bought these restaurants, they required them to only serve Pepsi on beverages from their soda fountains. For example, KFC used to sell Coca-Cola, but had to immediately switch to selling Pepsi instead after the sale to PepsiCo. Ironically though, this strategy of acquiring fast food restaurants sort of backfired a bit. Firstly, the industry was very competitive and it ended up diverting a lot of PepsiCo's resources away from their more profitable products. But also the biggest problem was that by getting involved with some fast food chains, it made rival fast food chains not want to sell Pepsi. For example, take a chain like Popeye's Chicken. If they were to sell Pepsi in their restaurants, they'd be kind of supporting KFC because Pepsi owned KFC. So basically, PepsiCo's idea of owning fast food restaurants to drive up sales of their beverages wasn't really having the desired effect. And so they spun off all their main restaurants into a separate company. So technically, PepsiCo no longer owns them. However, this didn't stop PepsiCo trying to expand into other random industries. Like at one point, Pepsi acquired the sporting goods company Wilson. But once again, after a few years, they realized these other acquisitions were a bit of a distraction and went back to doubling down on beverages and snack foods. And so PepsiCo's profits continued to rise and everything seemed to be going great. Little did Pepsi know, they were about to create one of the biggest marketing disasters in history that would cause them to owe tens of billions of dollars and have very fatal consequences. In 1992, Pepsi ran a contest in the Philippines called Number Fever. They printed numbers on each Pepsi bottle cap ranging from 001 to 999. And every night, they would reveal a winning number on the evening news. If you had a Pepsi brand bottle cap with that number on, you could redeem it for a prize. Now, most of the prizes you could win were fairly small, but there was also a big grand prize, 1 million pesos, equivalent of around $50,000, which was well over 600 times the monthly salary in the Philippines at the time. Needless to say, winning that prize would be a completely life-changing amount of money for the average Filipino. So the contest became hugely popular. It reached a point where around half of the people in the Philippines were participating in the contest by collecting Pepsi bottle caps. But not only were people buying more Pepsi for a chance to win, some were even searching the streets or looking through trash trying to find bottle caps that had been thrown away in case one of them had a winning number. Now obviously Pepsi had a budget for this campaign and so the idea was they had a computer system to determine which which numbers to print on bottle caps, as this way they could make sure that only two bottle caps were printed with the number for the grand prize of 1 million pesos. That meant only a maximum of two people could win the big grand prize, and Pepsi had control over how much money they gave away during the whole campaign. And the campaign worked great. Pepsi sales massively increased in the country because everyone wanted a chance to win. And so Pepsi decided it was working so well they would extend the contest by an additional five weeks. However, this is where the problems began. The computer system they were using to determine which numbers to print on bottle caps had not been designed for the competition to run this long, and so suddenly extending the competition caused a glitch that would have very drastic consequences. On May 25th, 1992, they announced the winning number of the 1 million peso prize, number 349. Now remember, there were supposed to be two people who had the winning bottle cap number. However, instead of just two winners like Pepsi expected, because of this glitch, they had printed over 600,000 bottle caps with the number 349. So as you can imagine, when the winning number was announced, hundreds of thousands of people across the country began celebrating, thinking they'd just won a million pesos. Many of these people were in dire poverty, and this was going to change everything for them. All their struggles were finally over. People began partying in the streets, and hundreds began showing up at the Pepsi factory to claim their prize. It was chaos outside, and the police eventually had to show up. Meanwhile, Pepsi executives were panicking and scrambling to figure out what to do next. If they actually paid everyone with the winning bottle cap number the amount they were owed, it would cost Pepsi over 30 billion US dollars. It would literally bankrupt the company. So they 
They instead announced the winning number was a mistake, but as a goodwill gesture, said that everyone who had a 349 bottle cap would be offered 500 pesos. This was the equivalent of about $18. A pretty big come down from the $50,000 they were sure they'd won. So as you can imagine, people were incredibly angry and upset about this. Many began rioting in the streets. People were throwing Molotov cocktails into the windows of the Pepsi factory and bombing trucks. Tragically, these riots left many people injured and five people dead. A group of winners called Coalition 349 decided to get together and sue Pepsi. But in the end, Pepsi only had to pay a fine of 150,000 pesos, which was completely insignificant to them, especially since the campaign had brought in millions of dollars of profit. To many, it was seen as a giant billion dollar corporation, giving people in poverty this glimmer of hope and then ripping it away. And just to add to the controversy even more, there were some newspapers that reported on a police testimonial from the time that claimed Pepsi had hired mercenaries to bomb their own trucks in order to make it look like Coalition 349 had done it and thus make them out to be thugs and damage their perception in court. Now of course Pepsi deny this and it may well be the case that the police officer's testimonial was wrong but either way this whole incident is a very dark part of Pepsi's history. It was a genuine mistake by Pepsi but their negligence had very real consequences. And this wasn't the only time that Pepsi got in trouble for running a faulty contest. In 1996 Pepsi started a campaign where you you could exchange points for prizes from their Pepsi stuff catalog. You could earn points by buying Pepsi products or purchase points for 10 cents each. In the commercial for the contest, they claim that for 7 million points, you could win a Harrier jet. This caught the attention of a business student named John Leonard. At the time, a Harrier jet was worth $23 million, and John realized that he could buy 7 million Pepsi points for $700,000. So clearly this was actually a great deal. After a few phone calls with investors, John got the money together and sent it in the paperwork to claim the Harrier jets. However, Pepsi claimed that their commercial was just a joke and never sent him his jet. So John decided to sue the company for false advertisement. In the end though, Pepsi won the case and they changed their commercial to include Just Kidding at the end and also increased the cost to 700 million points. So once again, Pepsi got away with it. However, to be honest, PepsiCo has a whole string of controversial ads. Like they made one for Mountain Dew that got described like this. It's being called the most racist commercial in history. The most racist commercial ever. And of course, more recently, who can forget the Live For Now Pepsi ad where Kendall Jenner seems to end a riot by giving a police officer a Pepsi. At a time of huge serious protests, including against police brutality, the idea of some mega rich influencer handing over a Pepsi to suddenly solve everything just seems so tone deaf. And to many, it just felt dismissive of people who'd been protesting for years or even been abused or arrested. Or as SNL put it, um, I stopped the police from shooting black people by handing them a Pepsi. I know, it's cute, right? However, despite having several terrible ads, Pepsi can also be credited with one of the greatest marketing campaigns ever. The ongoing rivalry between Coca-Cola and Pepsi is often known as the Cola Wars. And over the years, the two companies never held back from trying to knock one another down in their advertisements. They were the two biggest soft drink companies in the world, but Pepsi was always in second place. However, in 1975, Pepsi very nearly won the war when they introduced the Pepsi Challenge. This was an experiment where they filmed random participants doing a blind taste test. One cup had Coca-Cola, one cup had Pepsi. But people didn't know which was which and were asked which one they preferred the taste of. On average, slightly more people chose Pepsi. So Pepsi began running massive ad campaigns telling the world that in blind taste tests, people prefer Pepsi. At first, Coca-Cola strongly denied this, saying that there was no way it could be true and Pepsi obviously had a biased experiment. But after doing their own blind taste tests, Coca-Cola got the same result. More people really did seem to prefer Pepsi slightly more when they couldn't see which drink was which. This all seemed to indicate the main reason Coke was number one in sales was just because of their brand loyalty. This made Coca-Cola so nervous that they came out with a formula called New Coke in 1985. And this new formula did score better than Pepsi in blind taste tests but this completely backfired on Coke. They received thousands of angry letters and phone calls from fans who wanted the original Coke taste back instead. People hated the fact they'd changed the recipe and eventually Coke were pressured into reverting back to Coca-Cola Classic. This was where Coke got lucky though. People were so happy and thankful to have the original taste back after it had been taken away that Coca-Cola seemed to massively increase brand loyalty. And people were no longer talking about the Pepsi challenge, they were talking about the fact that original Coca-Cola had returned. And so the brutal reality 
for Pepsi is that despite all the success they've had in the last 100 plus years, when it comes to the simple battle between Coke or Pepsi, Coke's brand is still the winner. And if you want to know the real reason why Coca-Cola will always beat Pepsi's brand, then click this thumbnail now to find out the dark secret to Coke's success. I'll see you there in a second. Cheers.